From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start today on Capitol Hill, where Congress is considering budget resolutions for a new round of stimulus. And that's signaling President Biden may just be willing to go forward without Republicans if necessary. For the latest on what's going on on Capitol Hill, we welcome now Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government. Emily, always a delight to have you with us up there on Capitol Hill. What is going on with this budget resolution? So today we're glad to sort of two things going on. Number one, both the House and the Senate are moving forward on this budget resolution. We're going to see the Senate take a lot of votes tonight as Republicans try and get some amendments in there. From there, we've got about a two-week process where they're actually going to come together with the specifics of the bill, what that's what a budget reconciliation will actually look like. And from there, it's going to see if there is either some Republican support for the bill that's created in budget reconciliation or if Biden and uh, Senate Republicans wind up coming up with some sort of deal about how they can move forward with a bipartisan package. In the meantime, President Biden is not standing still. He's on his way today to Foggy Bottom, to the State Department, to give his first address on foreign policy. We just heard from Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor at the White House. Give us a sense of what we're likely to hear from President Biden today about foreign policy. Well, President Biden's really attempting to pivot here from the Trump administration and their policies. You've already seen Biden do things such as rejoin the World Health Organization, rejoin the Paris Climate Accords. I think he sort of wants to continue this message of trying to build up America's strength with our allies so then we can focus on countries where perhaps there are some concerns, such as Russia. Okay, thank you so much. Always great to have you with us. That's Bloomberg Government's Emily Wilkins on Capitol Hill. Welcome now, a veteran of the legislative process. Max Baucus served as Democratic Senator from Montana for nearly 36 years before he became U.S. Ambassador to China. We welcome him now back to Bloomberg. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. Let's start on Capitol Hill, if we could, because you have been through quite a few of these battles. What do you make of the president's decision, whether he wants to go by regular order, which would require getting past uh, the, uh, the filibuster rules and get 60 votes? or go just 50-50 and go with Kamala Harris. What do you think about that decision, whether to try to get the Republicans in or not? I think uh, President Biden um, wants to be president. He wants to go big. He wants to lead. And he knows that the country is facing a, this COVID crisis, is, 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 that he wants to do all he can as president to, to solve it and conquer it. He also is a man who uh, wants to unify the country, he wants to work with Republicans. That's a, his default. But um, if the Republicans don't come close to what he's suggesting, uh, $1.9 trillion, then I think he has no choice uh, but to proceed with the Democrats and go through reconciliation without Republican support. He will try to get Republican support. That's his nature. Um, and, the, you know, the proof's in the pudding, <laughs> whether they want to play ball or not. And based upon my experience, um, going back to the Affordable Care Act and, and, and some other major um, legislation of the Congress, I, and with the Trump um, uh, trial coming up and the Marjorie Greene issue in the, in the House, it just seems to me that the Republicans are not in a good frame of mind to want to negotiate, and that makes it difficult for President Biden to find a deal. So my guess is, in the final analysis, he's just going to have to go ahead. He may trim 1.9 a little, but not a lot. He has to be president. He has to lead. Well, I'm glad you raised the Affordable Care Act because you were there for that. And I think history right now is suggesting President Obama tried to be quite patient with Republicans to try to bring them along and in the end didn't get anybody to go with them. Do you believe the Democrats maybe have learned from that experience and are not as inclined to be as patient this time? I, I think to some degree that's true. Um, in addition, um, even though health care was a big need as health care reform was very neat back then. Today, COVID is a crisis. I mean, we have to move quickly. And that means President Biden's not going to dally very much. He's going to move ahead. If he does move ahead and he gets, if not $1.9 trillion, something close to it, uh, what does that do for any other things he wants to get through Congress for the rest of his term? Does that really limit his ability to get things done because the Republicans feel he went ahead without them? I'm very concerned that that will be the result. Um, but, you know, life's choices. The alternative for President Biden is to, is to, is to negotiate with the Republicans ad nauseum over and over again. I mean, it, it just, and that'll belittle him, that'll diminish him, and he can't do that. Um, the other op option, as we've discussed, is to just pull the plug, say, sorry, guys, I just, I, you're just not playing ball, you're not dealing in good faith, I have to go forward. 
So it's a choice. Um, but I, I, I'm concerned that the honeymoon already is coming to a close, uh, and it's going to be a difficult a couple of years. It's going to test the President Biden's leadership. And I hope very much that uh, that the, both parties realize that more often than not now that they've got to work better together because um, American people is, is, are, are getting more and more fed up with inaction and dysfunctional Washington. If President Biden does, in fact, go the budget reconciliation route, I think most people think he's going to have to leave a few things behind, like, for example, the federal minimum wage going up to $15. You served as chair of the Finance Committee in the United States Senate. What do you make of the federal minimum wage? How important is that? We heard Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, just a few minutes ago saying it's a real priority for Democrats. It's a priority, but clearly if there's a deal, that won't be in the deal um, because current minimum wage is about, I think, it's 7 50, something like that. So this doubles that. It's, it's, it's a bridge too far for a lot of Republicans. Um, I really don't think that should be in this bill. This should be a pure COVID stimulus bill. It should not include extraneous issues like minimum wage. Um, but that's the president's choice. And, and a lot of in the left wing of the party very much want to push it up to 15. So let me ask you to take your legislative hat off and push him and, and actually put on your uh, diplomatic hat as former ambassador to China. We have President Biden going to Foggy Bottom, the State Department today, where he is expected to announce uh, his foreign policy is going to be oriented toward the working people across the country, the middle class, as it were. Uh, and one of the things that appears to mean is really taking on China, really taking a look at the trade relations with China, making sure we're competitive with China. Uh, you have been a longtime observer of our relations with China. What do you think about that approach? Because you've said in the past you think there's room for really progress with China. It's not clear President Trump got that done. Well, um, this is lunch bucket joke. Um, President Biden always prided himself on being the lunch bucket Joe Biden, caring about the working stiff, the working men and women. And I, I think that is influencing his, his, this new tack on his foreign policy generally, making sure that working men and women have jobs. Now, um, I frankly think that the, that the, uh, <clears throat> the tariffs we've imposed against China are, are, are essentially counterproductive. But there's an opportunity there for, uh, for, for President Biden and President Xi to to do a deal, swap a couple of provisions, um, back off on a couple of the tariffs and, and that we've imposed, and at the same time, China open up their market a little bit. There, there's, there are opportunities to negotiate. But, and I, I all, it brings up the question of something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a big trade agreement that President Obama negotiated, but which uh, uh, President Trump um, pulled the plug on. And, it's, and many Democrats, maybe many foreign policy people, many multinational businesses, believe that the United States should go back and re-enter uh, re the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's under a new name now. But that's going to be difficult for President Biden because uh, he cares about jobs, and a lot of labor unions are going to put a lot of pressure on him not to go back into the TPP because it's going to take away jobs. Now, we know that sometimes those deals do take away jobs. Most jobs lost in America are not lost on account of trade. They're lost on account of advances in technology, new capital investments. But it's, it's still a big issue that Joe's going to have to focus on. Well, as you say, uh, Mr. Ambassador, there's a lot of hurdles to get over, both domestically, internally, with perhaps organized labor, for example, but also even whether we could go back and, and join at this late stage the TPP. Let's assume you got over those hurdles. How would the Chinese regime respond to that? Well, before I get to that, um, our Asian partners would very much appreciate that. Um, when I talk to um, ambassadors in, from Vietnam, et cetera, and other Southeast Asian countries, they tell me, boy, America, please get into that TPP because we need you. We need to lay you off against China. All those Southeast Asian countries you know, don't want to have to choose between the United States and China. They want to play us off against each other. So it's, uh, TPP is, is very important. It helps the United States for that reason. Now, that puts pressure on China. Um, and that's it's, it's good pressure on China. That makes China a little more honest. It keeps them um, on their toes. Um, but um, China basically wants to work with the United States. China is a conservative country. It, it likes the status quo. It doesn't like to rock the boat. Now, having said that, they're very nationalistic. They want to grow. They're going to develop their new technologies. They're going to try to be a, a greater economic influence, um, especially in Asia. 
Um, I don't think China wants to exercise much military aggression. China has, has a history not of, of, of a military aggressor. Rather, it's going to be economic kind of aggression. And it's a big, strong economy. That's their approach. Mr. Ambassador, it is such a pleasure always to speak with you. That's Senator and also former Ambassador Max Baucus, former Democratic Senator and former Ambassador to China. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. As David was just discussing, President Biden told House Democrats he will not back off from his plan to spend $1,400 checks to millions of Americans. This is a cornerstone of the coronavirus stimulus proposal and where the president's drawing a line. Mr. Biden says he is open to tightening the eligibility for the payments. Republicans have suggested the checks be smaller and fewer people should get them. This will be Janet Yellen's first public effort to address the turmoil involving GameStop shares and broker-dealer Robinhood. The Treasury Secretary meets today with financial regulators. Yellen spoke this morning to ABC News. We need to understand deeply what happened before we go to action, but certainly we're looking carefully at these events. We really need to make sure that our financial markets are functioning properly, efficiently, and that investors are protected. One of the regulators Secretary Yellen is meeting with the Securities and Exchange Commission has already said it's seeking to identify potential misconduct. Jobless claims for U.S. state unemployment benefits decreased by 33,000 to 779,000. This is the third consecutive drop. Economists believe this could signal job cuts are starting to slow as COVID-19 infections ebb. The drop in weekly claims comes ahead of Friday's monthly jobs report. It will be the first glimpse into the health of the labor market under President Biden. Officials say the UK is now past the peak of the latest wave of the coronavirus pandemic. The country's chief medical officer says there's a downward slope of cases, hospitalizations and deaths. Meanwhile, 10 million people in the UK have been vaccinated. That's about 15 percent of the population. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Mark. Coming up, we're going to talk about consumer and investor protection in the face of that retail trading frenzy. We're going to talk about it with Paul Hickey. He's co-founder of Bespoke Group. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time for a check on the markets. And for that, we turn to our colleague, Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. Kaylee? Well, David, it is definitely a risk on day, and the reflation trade is in full swing. The S&P 500 higher for a fourth day in a row, up about three quarters of 1%. But we have to take note of what is under and outperforming. Underperforming is big tech. The Nasdaq 100 only higher by about six tenths of 1%. What's outperforming is those small caps, cyclically sensitive, of course, and the Russell 2000 is up about 1.8%. Again, that is optimism on reflation. That is evident, too, in the bank stocks. The KBW Bank Index is on a tear. It's up about 3% in today's session, higher for the fourth day in a row, up about 8.5% over this week alone. And of course, part of what is feeding into that conversation for the banks is the steeper yield curve. The closely watched part of the curve is the spread between the five-year and 30-year yield. That curve is now the steepest since going back to October of 2015, right now sitting around 147 basis points. Again, the reflation trade in full swing. A lot of optimism about stimulus and hopes that it will bring more inflation and more growth. And finally, of course, David, I cannot go through a market check these days without talking about some of those favorite Reddit stocks. They saw meteoric rises, but that is quickly unwinding. A lot of those short squeezes, those positions have already needed to be covered. That means momentum is coming down. GameStop right now down about 26%. It hit an interday record high last week of $483 a share. 
It's trading around $67 a share right now. And some of the other poster children for that phenomenon, like ANC and costs, are lower by 13 and 20% in today's session, respectively, David. So a lot of retail investors who got into those stocks when they were high, losing some money today, David. Thank you so much for that market check from Kaylee Lyons. Well, Kaylee just led us exactly where we're going, which is those, as she called them, Reddit stocks. Markets were roiled over the last two weeks by the drama of retail investors in Robinhood and GameStop, with hedge funds at the center of that drama. Earlier today, Today, we asked Sebastian Malaby, who wrote the book on hedge funds, whether it all truly matters. Does it matter? Sure. It's interesting that um, more individual participation in stock trading is a rising force. I think that fintech will be here to stay and will continue to drive changes in the characteristics of markets. But I don't think it has to be destabilizing so long as the infrastructure um, is sound and you don't get interruptions in trading or the failure of a big clearinghouse. For his perspective on what happens when retail investors go on a crusade, we welcome now Paul Hickey, he's co-founder of Bespoke Group. Paul, great to have you back with us. Thanks for being here. So, so respond to what we just heard from Sebastian Malaby. Uh, how big a difference does this phenomenon that is GameStop really make in the longer term, or was it just a fill-up? Yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, all the talk uh, we heard about this new um, army of investors to, you know, Battle hedge funds and stuff. The last week was a was a, you know a, a good narrative, but um, a narrative at that. Um, you know, in reality, uh, I don't think it's this new force of um, of investment investor class, but investor participation in the market, um, individual investor participation in the market is a good thing for individual investors and the market overall. The key, though, is that. Um, that they're getting involved in the right way um, and doing it properly, which is, you know, following message boards and social media as, as to make your decisions is probably is probably not the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think a good quote from uh, Benjamin Graham where he said, even in the intelligent investor is likely to need considerable willpower to keep from following the crowd. Um, and then you hear, remember stories of Stan Druckenmiller in 2000, even though he knew that tech stocks were insanely overvalued, um, you know, going in and, and buying tech stocks, uh, you know, it was just a fear of missing out. He couldn't stand it anymore. And these are professional investors. So uh, an in individual investor just has to know what they're investing in and and getting invested right. in the right way. Well, the government wants to help us on this, I guess, Paul. We've got both uh, Treasury <laughs> Secretary Yellen today meeting with regulators, and we've got the Congress in a week or two getting to have some hearings on it. Are there things at least around the edges, some tweaks that maybe could be made, such as, for example, for a broker dealer like Robinhood to have to have more reserves to post so that they don't have to shut down trading? Oh, as far as the infrastructure of the market is concerned, I, I think regulators should, should definitely uh, look, look into those aspects um, and broker firms should be properly funded for the uh, order flow and orders they're taking. So by all means, um, I, I, I think that's a, um, a great a, a great approach that uh, regulators should be taking here. Um, in, investors should be protected from the firm they're doing business with um, remaining solvent. Uh, make a quick prediction here. Do you think we'll have a, this phenomenon again or is this a one-off? I mean, everything everything we've seen in the last two weeks, we've seen similar over the last uh, 100 years. Um, you know, as Mark Twain says, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. So we've seen similar types of stories, but you're never going to get an exact repeat of what we saw. But you're going to see um, irrational exuberance um, in, in other areas and other sectors of the market uh, over time. So it's just something that pops up. It's more of an anomaly than anything else. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's just a function of human psychology and human behavior. Okay, Paul, great to have you back with us. Thank you so much for being here. That's Paul Hickey. He's Bespoke Investment Group co-founder. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. As business owners everywhere know, their employees are now learning to work from home or remotely. And that has both some benefits and some challenges. Microsoft is trying to overcome the obstacles with a new product called Viva. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella spoke to Bloomberg exclusively about it earlier. 
putting these things all together, the employee engagement, learning, collaboration, and well-being, uh, into one experience platform is what Viva is all about. Uh, and I think that this represents a new category creation moment. Uh, if you look at what we've, the journey we've been on with Microsoft 365, we started with individual tools, it became a collaboration suite, uh, and now we think it's going to really get into a new space around employee experience, more holistically thinking about productivity, not just narrowly as output, but all of learning and well-being and collaboration. For more on the work from home culture and how it has affected the demand for chips, we welcome now Bloomberg's Emma Chandra. So Emma, as far as I can tell, people want more of them than the companies can produce. Uh, that is it in a nutshell, David. And I wanted to talk about specifically Qualcomm out with earnings, revenue blowing it out of the water, huge increase in revenue versus a year before. But yet we are seeing the stock tumble today down around 10% at the lows, in fact, hitting uh, its lowest level in about eight weeks for Qualcomm. And the reason is this concern about uh, supply, a uh, huge demand for chips, but Qualcomm not able to keep up uh, with that demand. And this is, of course, because they also outsource their chip making uh, capabilities to the likes of Taiwan Semiconductor, also Samsung, and those companies not able to ramp up production in the ways necessary in order to deal with this huge demand for chips. And it is related uh, to the global pandemic and the fact that we're seeing more people working from home, more people uh, buying and using devices that require these chips. Uh, we heard from Apple, of course, saying uh, that they uh, the demand for the iPhone 12 is huge, but they don't uh, can't get enough chips for it. It's not just working from home on computers though with the pandemic of course more people buying and using cars as they avoid public transport and so we're hearing from the automakers and likes of Ford GM saying that they're not able to ramp up production in the same way because they can't get the chips they need uh, for cars which are of course increasingly smart and so we're seeing this big uh, demand for chips but not able uh, to meet that but we are hearing from the companies that the second half of 2021 20, uh, we should see uh, that supply come back and that the demand may be able to be met uh, by the second half of this year, David. So hopefully we'll see a change in the story then. And certainly if you look at uh, the SOX, uh, the semiconductor index for this year, out uh, it's best, besting the broader market, David. Uh, so perhaps that's looking at what we might expect in the future. Sounds like there's a fair amount of capital investment coming online since at some point here. They're going to have to really build things. <laughs> Thanks so much to Bloomberg's Emma Chandra for that report on the microchip business. Coming up here, we're going to talk about the economic challenges Europe is facing from the United Kingdom to Italy. We're going to talk about it with Jacob Kierkegaard of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. He's a senior fellow there. We now have, of course, Mario Draghi trying to put together a new government in Italy facing a real challenge in a recession. But also we heard from the Bank of England just earlier today about what's going on in the United Kingdom. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Republican senators are countering what they call the Democrats' go-it-alone stimulus plan. How? With a flurry of mostly non-binding votes on Thursday. Dems are poised to pass President Biden's nearly $2 trillion pandemic relief plan without GOP support. The president's stimulus plan includes sending $1,400 checks to millions of Americans. Minority Leader Mitch McConnell says the votes will get senators on record on issues such as raising taxes on small business. House Democrats are heading into a showdown with Republicans over Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. The Democrats want to remove her from the two committees because of incendiary comments and her past promotion of conspiracies. Some Republicans have spoken out against Greene, but the House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, rejected calls for punishment. Manhattan saw co-op and condos double in comparison to last January, and this is the second month of contracts growth, according to Douglas Elliman Report. Buyers are sensing opportunities, sellers open to negotiate price, and mortgage rates hovering near record lows. The COVID-19 pandemic pummeled New York City residential real estate as buyers shunned city living for homes in the suburbs and other U.S. regions. 
Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks very much, Mark. The Bank of England announced its rate decision this morning, leaving things pretty much as they were. But Governor Andrew Bailey tried to have it both ways when it came to positive, possible negative interest rates on the horizon. We have said uh, many times that we have not given any signal on whether we would or indeed when we would use uh, negative interest rates. What we've said is that we think it's appropriate to have them as a tool that we could use, so as a tool in the toolbox. For more on the state of the British economy and beyond, we welcome now Jacob Kierkegaard from the Peterson Institute for International Economics, where he's a senior fellow. So, Jacob, always good to have you with us. Let's start with England, with Great Britain, the U.K. What's going on with their economy? What did we learn today? It looked like they're not expecting the growth they had hoped for this year, but maybe next year it gets better. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, the central bank there is in the same has the same issues as, as most central banks in the advanced economies, namely that they basically have to they have done a lot already, and they have to sit back and wait now for to see how the pandemic plays out uh, to basically calibrate their uh, policy responses. Fortunately for the Bank of England, uh, they have a very successful vaccine rollout uh, going on in the UK. So they should therefore uh, have, I think, and they, they also said that, they expect a fairly strong rebound to begin uh, in the second half of this year, continuing into next year. Um, but at the same time, it's very clear that uh, recent months and certainly the first quarter for the UK economy will be very tough. Uh, and we are looking at a possible, uh, you know, contraction in the first quarter, a double-dip recession. What would negative rates do for them? How would that help them? Well, I mean, it's, you know, to be perfectly honest, my, my view is that it would be uh, predominantly, uh, or I view negative rates, whether it's done by the ECB or anybody else, uh, very much has to do with an exchange rate uh, play, because I am yet to be convinced that uh, it has a huge uh, impact on how uh, you know, banks calibrate their lending decisions or investors take decisions. Uh, uh, so if you tr if you do it, uh, it's typically to try to drive down uh, your exchange rate, which may or may not have an effect in the UK. Uh, I, I don't know. But certainly, uh, you know, Governor Bailey was, if you like, sort of passive aggressive about it. He said, well, we're keeping our options open, but we're not. We really don't want to go there. But if you force us. Uh, so let's move over to Italy, uh, where there's a drama playing out yet again with the government, where we have Mario Draghi, the former president of the ECB, now put, uh, attempting to put together a government there. Give us a sense of what he's facing if, in fact, he succeeds in putting together, the, uh, together a government. Well, uh, his, his basic problem is that he's a technocrat. And currently, the biggest party in the Italian parliament, uh, which is also currently in the government, the Five Star Movement, basically rose to its prominence in protest against the repeated technocratic government led by, you know, other Marios, Mario Monti during the uh, Euro crisis some years ago. Uh, so they are going to face, you know, they're going to have a very hard time supporting yet another technocrat. Uh, and obviously, you have other parties, particularly on the right and the far right in Italy, uh, that are currently in opposition. They would love to have an election because they are going to, uh, at least according to the polls, they're going to be uh, winning those elections. Then you have the traditional center-right party, the PD party in Italy. Uh, their main concern is uh, to remain in power, to be in a position to help pick the next Italian president, uh, which actually, in my opinion, may very well turn out to be Mario Draghi. But that uh, uh, president is only, the next president is only selected early next year. Uh, so what I think we're looking at here is a sort of temporary technocratic government under the leadership of Mario Draghi that will probably be able to uh, competently handle and begin the implementation of the EU's uh, big recovery fund that basically is a big fiscal stimulus also in Italy. But... I strongly doubt that Mario Draghi will be able to put together a governing majority in both houses of parliament that's really going to be able to implement many of the economic reforms that Italy needs 
and that indeed Mario Draghi, when he was at the ECB, was advocating for countries like Italy. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. I mean, we all like fiscal stimulus. It gets us over, it ties us over, but you have to have structural reform at some point, I think. What is the structural reform that he would have to try to pursue in Italy if, in fact, Mario Draghi were to form a government? Well, I think there are several. I mean, fundamentally, Italy's problem is its low growth. Uh, a lot of that has to do with its demographic outlook, but it's also uh, very deep-rooted issues concerning the industrial structure in Italy. There is a, a lot of very small family-owned businesses that find it difficult to expand beyond their local markets, expand in, uh, or invest in enough IT. So he basically has to try to oversee a set of comprehensive reforms that will, uh, if you like, see consolidation of large parts of the in Italian Italian industrial sector. Uh, this isn't something that happens overnight. Uh, he's also going to have to continue to make reforms to push more Italian women into the labor market, into the labor force. Sorry, uh, Italy has arguably the lowest uh, female labor force participation of all major industrialized countries. So. With this demographic outlook, this is the biggest pool of untapped uh, labor resources that it needs to tap into if it's going to have growth going forward. In the meantime, it has a fairly large debt overhang, does it not? Yes. I mean, obviously, it's going to come out of the pandemic years with, I don't know, 160 or 170 percent of debt to GDP. But fortunately for Italy, it's also going to come out with very low debt service costs. Uh, basically a function of the uh, monetary policy of the ECB. Now, I take the view that the ECB is going to be uh, maintaining that very accommodative stance uh, for many years to come, simply because of the lack of inflationary pressures in an economy like the Eurozone. So I'm not particularly worried about the debt hang, the debt overhang, but it doesn't change the fact that what Italy needs uh, is growth, not just uh, in order to be able to better pay for its debt, but very much also to get better politics. There is a reason why the far right in Italy uh, keeps doing better and better in the polls. And a lot of that has to do with that Italy for the, you know, the 20 years of the euro era has systematically underperformed the rest of Europe. That needs to end if Italy's politics is going to become healthier as well as the uh, uh, economy. Jacob, great to have you with us as always. Thank you so much. That's Jacob Kierkegaard of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Coming up, we talk about the new way that New Yorkers will vote for their new mayor from the head of Common Cause New York. She is Susan Lerner. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. New York City will elect a new mayor this year, and it will use a different system to do it called preferential or ranked choice voting. To take us through how it will work, we welcome now Susan Lerner. She's executive director for Common Cause New York. So, Susan, thank you so much for being with us. For those of us not familiar, explain exactly how this works. Well, it's very simple. It is exactly what it sounds like. You rank your top five candidates in order of preference one through five is the system that we're using for new york city it's primary and special elections and is it used elsewhere in the country i think it is but it's for different levels of elections right well it's used in uh, a really significant number of places um san francisco has elected its mayor and municipal officers for over 15 years with ranked choice voting. Three other uh, cities in the Bay Area in California, Santa Fe, New Mexico, the state of Maine uses ranked choice voting to choose its presidential nominee and its governor and for uh, its members of Congress. Uh, and you've got uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and an increasing number of cities that are adopting ranked choice voting because it's such a pro-voter reform. Well, explain that. Why is it? What's, what's the difference? What's the difference in the result from ranked choice voting? Well, what ranked choice voting does is that it helps to build a consensus around the winner. You know, David, in New York City, we're very lucky. We have a very robust campaign finance system. And what that means is that we have often, luckily, a large number of people who are running for office, for city council, for mayor, for our other city offices. And when you have large fields, one of the results with the 
um, more typical uh, winner-take-all system is that the winner can win in a plurality race with sometimes as little as 30 or 25 percent of the vote. That means that the vast majority of people didn't choose that the person who ends up being in office. So ranked choice voting builds a consensus around the winner so that uh, you have a winner who is a consensus choice of the majority of voters that they're going to represent. And that's good for democracy. Well, consensus is a word we don't often these days hear around national politics. It's, it's more going for the extremes, the far right and the far left, because people can really get a very firm base behind them. Uh, what's the experience elsewhere in the United States, for the matter internationally as well, because as I understand, this has been used in other countries. What's the experience? Do you tend to have more moderate candidates who prevail? You know, it, it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Australia uses it. Ireland uses it. India elects their president with ranked choice voting. It, what it does is it puts the power back into the hands of the people uh, and, if, and, and allows them to coalesce around one candidate and to avoid splitting the vote, right? So in Maine, for several cycles, they had a mayor, uh, I'm sorry, they had a governor um, who won because the vote was split between Democrats and Republicans, uh, and he drove uh, his way through, even though he was far from the consensus choice. And there's often a great fear when you have many candidates, particularly candidates coming from the same community, that they're going to split the vote. Voters worry about wasting their vote, and ranked choice voting eliminates that fear. You get to vote for your uh, first choice, and you don't have to worry, oh, am I wasting my vote? It's the candidate that you believe in that you rank first, so, because you have your backup choices. Yeah, you just made, I think, a very important point, which is incumbents might not like ranked choice voting, switching to ranked choice voting, because the way they got elected under the current system, and some of them got elected maybe because there wasn't ranked choice voting. So how does a city like New York come to conclude they will do that? Because the politicians voting for it got elected under the old system. Well, you know, this was a measure that was suggested by our Charter Revision Commission. It went in front of the voters in 2019. In order to change the way we vote in New York City, the voters have to approve the change. And in 2019, New York City voters overwhelmingly approved ranked choice voting with nearly 74 percent of the vote. Fascinating. So give us a sense. What's the timing here? When's the election itself? When are the primaries? So the primary, the, the citywide primary, is June 22nd of this year. Uh, ranked choice voting has went into effect on January 1st, and that means that the special elections, uh, we've got four special elections, one just concluded, and three more to come to fill vacancies in the city council, and those are all ranked choice voting elections, but for a, a smaller uh, district mm -hmm. uh, rather than citywide. A whole new world here in New York City. Thank you so much to Susan Lerner. She's executive director of Common Cause New York. Coming up, we're going to talk with AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka about the incoming head of the Labor Department and what he hopes is first on his agenda. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Biden's pick for Labor Secretary, Marty Walsh, goes before the Senate Labor Committee today. In fact, I think it might be happening right now for his confirmation hearing. But the Biden administration has already begun the process of changing its predecessor's labor policies. To give us the view from organized labor, we welcome now Richard Trumpka. He's president of the AFL-CAO. I always like to say it's like something like 2.5 million members. So great to have you with us, Richard. Uh, first of all, Marty Walsh, you, ta you talked 12, about... 12.5 million. 12, I'm sorry, 12.5. I didn't want to shortchange you there. Um, <laughs> Uh, tell us about Marty Walsh. I know that we've talked about him before. You're in favor. Do you think there's any question about his confirmation? I think uh, Marty's going to be confirmed because he's a, a quality candidate. He was a great mayor. Uh, he took care of, of, of business for Massachusetts. He understands workers, uh, and I think he'll do a great job of rebuilding OSHA, rebuilding MSHA, rebuilding the wage and hours uh, that have been allowed to atrophy at the Department of Labor under the last administration. I think Marty is the perfect guy. He carried the tools, so he knows workers, he knows what we're about, and he knows how important collective bargaining is 
to keep a good balance at the work site. So uh, I haven't heard much rumbling about Marty Walsh at all. Uh, I have heard some rumbling, though, about some of the other people perhaps being put in the Labor Department. Some questions about whether when in their prior jobs they were uh, sufficiently diligent in distributing unemployment insurance. We have one woman for the state of Washington, for example. What do you make of that? Has there been a fair amount of fraud in some of the unemployment benefits that have been paid? Uh, I, I think there probably has been some, but it's been mostly on, on the pandemic unemployment sure, uh, side, mm -hmm. not the unemployment insurance. There's two levels under the uh, Act, or the CARES Act. One was the regular un unemployment insurance, uh, and again, that, that month, this month, we had about uh, 800,000 of those, and then there were about 400, 350,000 of the pandemic unemployment insurance. Uh, I think there were some miscomings there, and I think they're uh, in the process of straightening those out. They should. They need to, and we're supportive of that process. So, so uh, you have talked with us before about union organizing uh, and getting certification for unions, something that the Biden administration appears to be much more open to than others. Talk about Amazon. There are efforts, as I understand, to unionize at least some of the employees of Amazon. Uh, what role is the government playing in this, as far as you know, and what role should the government play? I mean, you, you want them to be open to it and constructing it such that it can happen, but do you want them affirmatively to be helping organize? Well, look, let's be honest about this. Over the last several years, particularly the last four, they've been very, very hostile to the process the government has. The people that were in charge of uh, protecting the rights of workers were hostile to those rights. Uh, the guy that was the general counsel of the NLRB, for instance, his former career was a union buster. And they put him in as general counsel of the NLRB to protect workers' rights. He protected them all right. He attacked them every day for three years. Mm -hmm. What we expect from the government is to give us a fair chance to enforce mm -hmm. the law and help us right now change the law because the law is currently antiquated. It was made uh, 75, 80 years ago. Uh, it no longer protects workers' rights. It actually is used to prevent workers from getting a raise or, or additional health care or pension benefits. It should be used to help them get it. Hopefully we'll, we'll get the PRO Act passed uh, under this administration and the balance that, between employers and employees that has swung so far in the employer's favor will level out and we'll be able to get better decisions so that the system starts to work for the employers and the employees, not just the people at the top, not just management, not just the shareholders, not just the owners. In connection with Marty Walsh, you mentioned OSHA and what you hope to have some reform there. We have now had a House uh, committee say they're going to investigate uh, what happened at Tyson Foods, something you've raised with us before, what's happened in meatpacking under COVID. Uh, what is going on there? What needs to be done? Well, first of all, look at the culture that they had there. Uh, Tyson managers were betting on how many of their workers would get COVID. They had a pool. They had an over and under pool. Now, if you're a work, if you're an employer, uh, a management, a frontline supervisor, and you're betting on people to get COVID, uh, the, the culture is bad. Uh, hopefully, you know, unions would stop that. Unions would stop them from being able uh, to just have willy-nilly, no safety conditions. We would instill safer working conditions. We would instill just cause for discharges rather than at will. Currently, under the law, you can be discharged for any reason or no reason, uh, and you have no recourse. Uh, we would make them so they had a just cause re recourse there. And then, of course, we'd have a grievance procedure so the differences between employees and employees uh, could be settled quickly. But we also act as a balance. You know, you wouldn't be able to have Tyson's food uh, trying to do price fixing. They just settled the... Uh, a dispute for price fixing, and although they didn't admit uh, guilt, uh, they, they paid a lot of money, $221 million, in just one of those lawsuits. We, we sort of act as a watchdog and prevent, in many instances, those things from happening as well. Give us a sense, for those of us not as familiar with this as you are, Richard, how much can uh, the new Labor Secretary, we're assuming he will be confirmed, can he do right away, just with the stroke of the pen, how much has to go through rulemaking to take some time, and then how much needs legislation? Well, I think there'll be all of those things. Uh, w what he can do right now is restock and re retool OSHA. OSHA, as I said many times on this show, has become a cadaver. It has fewer inspectors now than it's ever had in its history, and those inspectors were demoralized. They were told not to inspect. 
So that can change immediately with Marty, and I'm sure it will. Uh, the same thing will happen at, at, at MSHA, the Mine Safety Health Administration. And the same thing will happen at Wage and Hours, where people are being cheated out of wages uh, because they were misclassified. Uh, that will end uh, very, very quickly. Uh, there will be some rulemaking, uh, some to undo the rules uh, of the last administration that were designed to hurt workers and expose us to more chemicals and more dust and uh, more, more things that were harmful to our health, uh, and some that will be safety, that will be go forward and get us better safety regulations. And then hopefully uh, there will be legislation. The legislation will be the PRO Act, uh, and the PRO Act will change the laws of the land and get rid of uh, – old relics uh, of Jim Crow, there's a thing called right to work, uh, yeah. David, and it is one of the last relics of the Jim Crow era. Hmm. Uh, it was passed originally down south right. so that black worker, white workers didn't have to belong to the same union as a white worker. Yeah. We need to get rid of those relics as well. Well, it sounds like a lot on Marty Walsh's agenda when he comes into office, assuming he is confirmed, which we all do. Thank you so much to AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk with Quaylen Ellengrud. She's senior partner at McKinsey about the effect of the recession on the U.S. economy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.